Welcome to another episode of At the Table with Patrick Lencioni, where everything we talk about is related to changing the world of work so that more organizations can be more effective and less dysfunctional, and employees can be more fulfilled and less miserable. I'm your host, Pat Lencioni, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Cody Thompson. How's it going, Pat? I'm also joined, as always, by Tracy Noble, but she's on the microphone today. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? And we've got our engineer, Matt, in the room. How you doing, Matt? Good. Silent. <laughs> nod. Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> hey, before we get into the topic, I wanted to say something. So I listen to our podcasts as a form of sadomasochism. In fact, <laughs> you could say to me if I did something wrong, you can go to prison or you can have to listen to your podcast over and over and I'd probably take prison because it's not fun. But one of the things I noticed is that during these podcasts, I always feel the need to keep the conversation going, like if there's ever any lull. And so I talk a lot just to fill in the spaces. I'm going to try not to do that today. Well, then you're just going to make me miserable when I listen. (laughs) We we have the same sentiment. It's hard to listen to yourself, but we're we're thrilled that so many people don't find it as annoying as we do. Yeah, don't don't change a thing. Keep doing what you're doing. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. (laughs) Okay, so today's title of the podcast, Cody, what is it? Oh, drum roll here, because I think we're sneaking another one past Tracy. That's right. Politics sucks. That's right. We're going to get used the sucks word in there again. <laughs> Tracy is actually not against it. You don't have to send her hate mail. <laughs> That's right. I got I got a few hate messages about that. So. Yes. But And in fact, we talked about should it be politics suck or politics sucks, but it's politics is actually a singular word. So that's why we can say politics sucks. And it indeed does suck. But we're not talking about politics as it exists in government or elections. We're talking about politics in the workplace, which is one of the most painful, damaging, and success-killing realities in business. Now, it's not completely removed from politics, though, as it exists in government. In fact, I think it's terrible that we call the act of governing politics or that people become a politician. I think, unfortunately, that's too often what people in government do. But let's define politics, at at least the way we do it in business. We would say politics is when people choose their words and actions, not based on what they actually think, but based on what they want others to do as a reaction. It's a form of manipulation, and it's, it's a violation of honesty. Now, the opposite of politics, then, is truth-telling or raw honesty. And it's hard to imagine making a case for anything but that when it comes to a group of people trying to get the most done in the least amount of time in a way that produces the best ideas or products. And yet politics, again, one of the worst things that can plague an organization is so common. Avoiding it takes real effort and commitment and courage, and it's at the heart of much of what we do around organizational health, and that's the subject of today's podcast. And so let's dive in. I love what you said there, Pat. The phrase, this is a quote that I see circulating in social media too, when you say that politics is saying or doing something based on the reaction you're going to get from people versus what you actually believe. Right. And at the most fundamental level, if you're doing that at a company or in your family, that's what we're talking about here. And it's far too prevalent. I actually remember when I first came to Table Group six years ago, thinking, man, there's something different happening here in the conversations. People actually are saying what they mean versus a lot of my experience prior to this. When you're in the room and you can see that someone's sort of posturing or positioning, that is like the norm. I was just going to say, mm-hmm. yeah, it's really the norm. In mo- for me, in my career, that's how it almost always worked. Yeah. Well, it's part of the reason why we started the table group, right, Pat? Yeah, that's true, I mean, because we, we were, were tired of going to meetings and saying things we yes. didn't mean. Yeah, it was awful. Which, which I think is worthwhile to say right off the bat, and that is many people who engage in politics, it's not because they're naturally politicians, it's because they are in an environment that encourages that or rewards it. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many people that want to escape that. So we started our company. Really, the main reason was we wanted to go to work someplace where we could tell the truth. We could see people at work and think, this is a person who wants to hear what I actually have to say, not what what they want me to say. And that's a huge difference. And I think it's been a big competitive advantage for us. Oh, of course. Well, it's worth saying that as we are preparing for this, thinking about people are learning this in the workplace, but you don't learn it when you get older. This is something like you, mm-hmm. you talked about, where do you actually pick this up? Yeah, when we were talking about this podcast today, we don't plan these out in great detail, but I said, where does this come from? How old are we? And I remember my dad coming home from work and talking about what he could and couldn't say to the manager mm-hmm. in the office and thinking, yeah. why, do, why do you have to think about what you're trying to say? And of course, then from an early age, we realized, oh, this is kind of how, and it goes to school that way too. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, you think about being in the classroom with all your friends, the person that is one way in front of the teacher and then is a totally different person when the teacher's not in the room or, you know, is a sort of the suck up is the term, you know, yeah. the, the other quote that you had, which I love is when you, when what you do or say changes, depending on who's in the room, that's how you know what politics, if, if you're participating in the sort of the political environment. I don't think I said that, or if I did, I don't remember it, but I think it fits. <laughs> Someone might've attributed it to you. I just did. So, remember being in class and that kid who was sucking up to the teacher and you knew would go out in the recess and make fun of her or him. And, and, and you were like, oh, that's gross. Totally. And if far too often you're in meetings and you're seeing someone say something to the boss or a coworker and you're like, that's just one day ago, I heard you say something completely different about how mad or frustrated this person makes you. And then in the context of this meeting, you are praising them or, and it's, it's like you said, the external and internal reality don't match. Like I use the word integrity for that. For, for me, integrity means that to be integrous means that what I do and say reflects what I believe, you know, or what I think is true. And when you violate that, when you break that, people can observe it. And then people learn that that's how they behave in environments like in the workplace. And it's all downhill from there. You know, Matt here, our engineer and Liam, his buddy that we hired right out of college, they would tell me all the time and my son Connor and others at school too, about how politics played itself out in the classroom there. And they would often say, oh yeah, we don't say what we think. We just tell the professor what they want to hear. Right. And it's because they wanted to get a grade and the professor wasn't interested in their true opinions, which of course is the death knell of like free learning. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, that's a tragedy. But the point is when that exists in an organization, is it any wonder that we're not making good decisions, that we're not quickly moving through issues and that productivity suffers and morale suffers? This is one of the most horrible things you can have in an organization. And again, I can't believe how common it is. One, just to bring people in. So, you know, we think of these topics every week. This is in part because of what we're seeing play out in politics, but also because you and I just had a really interesting, like st intense strategic conversation yeah, a couple of days ago. Yep. And in the midst of it, you, we paused because we, we, we do have two, two new employees. And so we were They're both 22. Right. And, and we were trying to explain, here's why we move faster and get more done than other organizations. And we used a couple examples of things that you and I said to each other in that exact conversation. We, we were getting pretty heated, but then at one point you had said something and I immediately said, I don't believe you. And right. you, without, without saying, well, like defending your answer, you said, actually, yeah, you're probably right. You know, right, in right, that right. moment. <laughs> and then later on in the conversation, we were talking about this big project that we're launching that I'm on the team that's helping launch it. And I feel really responsible for it. And I said in front of them, which I felt like was a little shock value to them was, if this doesn't go well in a year from now, I should probably step down. Like I should probably I think you said quit. get fired. Get fired. Yeah. <laughs> and, you did. Yes. Yeah, right. And I didn't say that for effect. I said it because I felt that responsibility. And so we paused for a moment. And we're like, do you guys understand <laughs> how, what, what's happening here? We're, we're having a very raw, integrous conversation about this stuff that if we were in a different organization, my posture would have been, hey, if this doesn't work, I'm going to figure out who I'm going to blame this on. That's you know, right. It's never my, my problem. Right. You know, and, and I have to say this about our company is the idea of tr taking credit for something that you didn't do is so antithetical here. It's right. so gross. And we have this joke around the office, Karen, who's very meek and humble and kind. And she, when she comes up with a great idea, there, there was a couple of times years ago that nobody would hear it and somebody else would say it. And then we go, that's a great idea. And we finally realized like Karen would be like, I said that a few minutes ago. Now she gets credit for everything. Yeah, every time somebody comes up with a great idea, we're like, way to go, Karen. That was a great, great idea. In idea. fact, we know another organization has a picture of Karen on the wall because they heard about this. And when anybody comes it's up with so a great awesome. idea, they say, way to go, Karen. But that is totally true about the, the culture here is it's almost immediate. If someone says, hey, Tracy, good idea. Within seconds, you say, actually, it was Amy's idea. That's right. It's a part of our culture. Like no one wants to even take credit for something that's not theirs for an instant. They immediately attribute it to the right And you person. know what I realized too is that Liam and Matt, this is their first job out of school and they've been here a little over a month. And your first job sets the tone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember yeah. my first job and there was a crap load of politics. It's like, who are you talking to? What level are they? How much influence do they have on your career? What are you going to say? Yep. And here we are sending a message to them is like, don't ever do that. Right. Don't ever. In fact, we've taught these guys to challenge us mm -hmm. because they have skills that we don't have. 
and they're doing it, which is, which is really good. I think we're ruining them. In fact, if they go to another company where there's politics, it's going to be horrible. Right. Oh yeah. It's, there, it's, that's not going to work. Right. There's that's no a, way. And that's not to say we're perfect at all, but the one thing we don't do is reward people who don't say what they're really thinking. And that is probably one of the most important practical messages of today is that if you're in an organization that's political, what you need to do is just stop tolerating it, kindly point it out and say, hey, let's actually not say things that we don't mean. And if you're a leader, just when you see that happening, kindly point it out to people. And over time, it will start to mitigate. Right. I love making it super practical in the sense of here's what you can observe so that the listeners are like, yeah, this is how it plays out in my organization. But I think one of the other things that we talk about is meetings before meetings and meetings after meetings. That is the, that is a telltale sign of politics in an organization because it's like, it's all about perception. It means that I'm, I'm prepping someone in advance of a meeting so that they come across a certain way, or, or I can say what I really mean in front of uh, in a one-on-one situation, but I won't say it in the context of the whole team or damage control afterwards, you know? Yeah. Or, or you get off the, and especially now with, with a lot of things being virtual, you have a meeting internal to your organization and then you call somebody afterward and say, Hey, can you believe they said that? <laughs> right. And it's like, no, all of that should take place on that zoom call. Yep. And, and you know what? People often will ask us about when they deliver feedback or when they see this type of politics playing out, they say, Hey, should this happen in a one-on-one? Should I, should I do a one-on-one conversation with this person to, to kind of tease this out? And almost always, we, there's the very few no. one-on-one conversations that happen yep, here. That's right. It's almost always in the context of the team or the project that we're working on because we need to practice this in our organizations to try to eliminate what's going on. If it, if it happens behind closed doors, we're not rewarding mm-hmm. people saying what they mean. You know what I just realized? I remember that great quote from... Mark Twain, who said, always tell the truth and you never have to remember what you said. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, so and, and when people go, you didn't say that yesterday. Oh, I didn't. Oh, then I've, I've totally changed my mind, but I'll own that. Right. I, I, sh- I, I didn't. I'm, I've changed my mind now. It's just a lot cleaner to be able to say, okay, I, I must have been thinking differently yesterday. I don't know if that made any sense at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, that'll be one when you're re-listening to it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the other thing that, that came up for me is I do think, because when my wife, Lindsay, was, was in the workplace, I had a similar reaction to the way you reacted to your dad. Like, why don't you just tell them this? She was, you know, she'd go back over and tell me about her day and difficult conversations that would happen. It's like, why don't you just say this to her? And she says, oh, I can't. That's not how it works in this organization. Mm-hmm. I think that so, it's so prevalent that even I would imagine as people are listening to this, they're like, you guys kind of live in Disneyland, you know, like. Absolutely. There's other Disneylands out there though. Right. And they're doing well. But you don't build Disneyland. It's not pristine out of, out of the gate. It's like you have to take a baby step the first time to and say- And it's messy. To call it out. And it's messy. But over time, you, if you start calling it out, if you start rewarding the people that say what they mean, the ones that will do it in the meeting and not after the meeting, you know, that's how you build it. I think I just realized one of the reasons why politics exists is because Essentially, you, you can use politics to avoid discomfort in the moment. Mm-hmm. Now, it always comes out later. It's really awful. Mm-hmm. But in the moment, by kind of thinking about what you're going to say, you avoid that messy conversation during the meeting. But you pay for it later. It gets much worse. Right. So I think that sometimes we say people are political because they're just conniving. But I think they're like, oh, I just don't want to feel uncomfortable right now. But then eventually they're going to feel that way anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. You're right. It's not always like this intentionally malicious thing. It's actually, it can happen as a result of someone avoiding discomfort. Yeah. You know something, I, we were talking just before we started to about the book, The Ideal Team Player. And the very worst type of a potential team player is somebody that is hungry and interpersonally smart and they lack humility. And we, we labeled that type the skillful politician. Mm-hmm. And we didn't mean it from a standpoint of you know, running for office. We meant it from the standpoint of that's a person who says things and tries to create a perception of themselves that's not true so they can manipulate you and achieve what they want at your expense. Right. And so there's a reason why we use that word. Politics is awful. You tell this great story about the most notorious, not notorious, but in your career, there was a one particular skillful politician that was doubly skillful in the sense that they were Canadian, right? Oh, yeah, 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 you yeah, tell yeah. that story. <laughs> and we say that because you don't think Canadians as being political like that. They're usually pretty upfront and honest and nice. 
but but t- tell tell the listeners about how you uncovered this. I mean, this is the perfect example of someone that was perceived a certain way, even fooled you a little bit. Oh, a lot of it. And and then it came out at the end of the day that they were just a politician. Yeah, you know, we worked with this technology company and this this guy was in charge of doing deals and and every time he did an acquisition, heads would roll except for his and he was he was making a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And yet when he went to meetings, he acted like, okay, we're all in it together and we're trying to do the right thing. And there, like three acquisitions happened before people realized, oh my gosh, I think this is about his career and his compensation. And he was not really telling us the truth at meetings. We were hearing things behind the scenes. And by the time we figured it out, there was a lot of dead bodies hidden in closets around the organization. Mm. And so the point of the matter is, you know, those people, the ones that know how to pretend they're not political, are the worst kind. Are the worst kind. Mm-hmm. You know, some, I'm going to tell you something that's going to happen here in a few minutes. In fact, in about 15 minutes, I have a call. So I'm going to talk to the principal of my son's school about some issues going on there that are kind of sensitive and con- slightly controversial. And, and I remember thinking when it happened, I thought, and she's a reasonable person, and I know her, and we have a relationship. We probably don't agree on everything, but I thought, am I going to write a letter? Am I going to write an anonymous letter? And I'm like, no. Am I going to go talk to about behind her back? No, but that's very tempting because you think, well, she might not want to hear what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, this is so stupid. So I'm going to be talking to her in 15 minutes. I'm going to tell her exactly where I'm coming from. I'm going to listen to where she's coming from. We're going to work on this together. It's going to be for the good of the school. I'm going to feel better. My family's going to feel better. The school's going to be better as a result of that. And our relationship is going to improve. But it's so tempting in those kind of situations to play politics Mm -hmm. and to hide behind an email or a letter writing campaign or something like that. And this happens all the time in organizations and in society and in community. And so, I mean, and this is going on in real time right now. I'm 15 minutes away from this. I was kind of, I was kind of worried about it. Right. You know, something when I sent her the email saying we should talk, she goes, Hey, I just listened to one of your podcasts. And I thought, (laughs) this is so great because we're all just trying to pursue truth and do the right things. That's what the absence of politics allows. Yeah. And it, it, you, like we said at the beginning, you make better decisions, faster decisions. We cycle through things a lot more quickly. It reminded me, that story reminded me of why we, people always ask us about like 360 feedback or, or tools like that. It's oh, like, yeah. part of that is because people aren't willing to say things to another person across a table that they're willing to put in a form anonymously. And that's just another form of politics. Yeah. And that's then they right. read about it. In a, in a report and they think, who said this about me? We've right. all seen that. Like, who, God, said, me so out? who said this? And then the report gets published or something like that. And we're like, <laughs> how about we just sit around a table and tell each other what we love about them and what they frustrate us by yeah. doing. Yeah. And what's crazy is just a little bit of exposure therapy. Like if you just dip your, your toe in the pool and try it out, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. It yeah. really isn't. I, I'm not very good at this, but if I just dip my toe in the pool, it's, it's like, it's this liberating feeling. You yep. can do it. It's and, not that hard. And people will be glad to run politics out of the organization. That's right. In fact, one way to do it is to say, hey, let's, let's stop right now and decide we're not going to be doing this anymore. And if we, if we feel like we're, we need to do it or you see somebody else doing it, let's have enough grace to say, hey, it feels like you're not saying the truth or, mm-hmm. hey, I'm really tempted right now to, to play politics here, but let's not do that. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's, and eventually you can create a new culture where that doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. The last thing I want to do is I do want to make a, a very controversial statement about politics because as it, re, as it pertains to elections and things like that. And I, I, I want to say this because it's not controversial, but when someone isn't interested in hearing opposing points of view around government, elections, or anything like that, and when they attack you for merely having a different point of view, or because you plan to vote for somebody that they wouldn't vote for. If that's what they do and they don't want to listen, you can rest assured that their ideas or positions are probably not based in reason and logic. One of the best ways to evaluate the value of another person's ideas is to see whether they can calmly and fairly present a reasoned defense of them. And we can use that in election politics. We can use it in office politics. We can use it in our family. Mm -hmm. And if I say to one of my sons, hey, I don't like that you did that, and he just goes off on me for telling him that, probably he's not feeling very good about who he's going to vote for. (laughs) (laughs) Vote for dad, vote for mom. (laughs) And that's the end of today's discussion of politics, why it sucks, and how we can try to overcome it. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Cody. Thank you, Matt. And we will see you next week on 
At the Table with Patrick Lynchoni. God bless. <laughs>